Revelation chapter 1. I want us to look at verses 7 and 8. But before we do, I want us to go back to verse 3 and just be reminded because John tells us, Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy. Heed the things which are written thereof, for the time is near. What we have here is a preview of the second coming. Now, a preview is an advanced showing of something before it's made known to the public. <clears throat> I just found out yesterday that Star Wars, the last Star Wars, book nine, will be out on December the 20th, The Rise of Skywalker. Now, for you, that may mean absolutely nothing, but to me, I'm going to see if I can get a ticket probably in June when they go on sale for that event because I've seen all the rest of them. But there'll be a lot of previews. All the actors will come together in Hollywood, and there'll be a big preview. They'll see it before we do. And there'll be other previews with different groups of people. But finally, the public will be made known of that. And that's exactly what a preview is. And so what, what the Lord is doing here in this, these two verses, he's giving us a preview of the second coming. Now, I want to remind you, the second coming and the rapture are not the same thing. Because the next thing on God's agenda is the rapture of the church. Then there's the seven years of tribulation while you and I are at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Then after the seven years of tribulation, that's when the second coming comes. And just like Enoch said, I saw the Lord coming with ten thousands of his saints. That's when you and I, with the angels of heaven, will be led by Christ back to the earth. And that's what this is talking about in these two verses. It's talking about the second coming. And this is just a preview. We're going to see very, very good details of this event as we go through Revelation. But at the very beginning... Uh, God gave John this vision, and he wants us to know, let me give you a preview of what you're going to study or what you're going to hear in just the days and weeks and months to come. The challenge of the book of Revelation is to make every person ready for this second return. Now, for you and I who are believers, we put our faith and trust in Christ, we're going to be gone, and that's going to be a great thing because we'll come back with him. But for those who haven't put their faith and trust, by the time the rapture takes place, that what will happen is they'll go through the seven years of tribulation, and some of them will be saved. The Bible says there'll be 144,000 flaming tongue evangelists from Jerusalem, plus the, two, plus the two martyrs that will come. There will be people saved during the seven years of tribulation, but they have to go through the tribulation. And so for those, it'll be a joyous time, because finally it'll be for them a beginning. But for others, it'll be a very, very horrible time. Look at verses 7 and 8. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him, so it is meant to be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is, who was, and who is to come. I am the Almighty. Last week we looked at the book of Revelation as the ultimate thriller. It began last week, it intensifies this week, and it will continue to intensify as we get deeper and deeper into it. So what we have here is a preview of the Lord. And of course, it's going to be great encouragement for those who go through the tribulation and they become believers, they put their faith and trust in Christ. So when he comes back for them, it will be a joyous time. But notice what it says, it says, everyone will see him. And I love the way, the way we, try to, we try to help God out. And so it says here that every eye is going to see him. Now, there, I don't care where you are in space. There's nowhere in space that one person could stand and everybody on the globe could see him. So we say, well, you know, there's technology today. And with all the interconnectedness, why, why Jesus could be in Atlanta, Georgia, could be seen all over the world. I don't think it has anything to do with technology. Because I'm convinced that the one that created this world, if he wants everybody to see him at one time, that's not a challenge for him. It may be a challenge for us to understand, but the Bible makes it clear that everyone will see him and, and the nations will mourn. Well, why will the nations mourn? He tells us why they will mourn. Because this book is about Jesus, the coming one, the expected one. Even John the Baptist, while he was in prison, he says, are you the expected one? Are you the echomai? Now, the word echomai is used nine times in the, in the book of Revelation. And it always refers to the coming one, the one who is to be coming. And there's three things I want us to look at this morning. First thing is behold his coming. Look at that word behold there. I love that. Behold means to call to attention. It's used to remind us that he wants to arouse the heart and arouse our mind so that we might consider what's following. So, so John's about to tell us, I'm, I'm going to tell you something. In fact, he's going to tell us 25 times in Revelation, behold. 
And so when he says, behold, he said, I want your attention. Don't be daydreaming. Don't be thinking about what you're going to do for lunch. Don't be thinking about what you're going to do next week. He says, I want you to behold. I want your attention because I'm about to say something that's very, very important. And so John says, behold, pay attention to his coming. Now, John connects the word behold with the present tense for echomai, which is, is coming. Now, I love this because it means much, much more than just the present tense that he's coming. It literally means he's already on the way. That's exactly what it means. It, it means something that's happening to me like if, if uh, Brother Phil were to call my house this morning and, and uh, when I was in the shower and, and say, is, is the preacher coming to church today? And David said, well, yeah, he's coming. Not on the way yet, but he's coming. But had he were to call it after 8 o'clock, she would say, yeah, he's already left. He's on the way. Now, what is, if I'm on the way, what does that mean? It means my coming here is assured. And what John is saying is the Lord is already on the way. He's, he's already made arrangements. Actually, the verb, when you put the subject and verb together, what it's talking about, his coming is hanging on the edge of the present and on, on the edge of the future. And so what he's saying here is everyone will see him. He's already on the way. And, there's, and, and so John is being assured that there's a day coming when the Lord himself will return. In fact, he's already started the process. Now, we don't know how long the process is. For you and I, we say, well, but that's been 2,000 years ago when this was written. But I want to remind you, God's removed from time and space. And so what, what it means is it's just, it's just like 2,000 years for him just batting his eyes. He closed his eyes and opened his eyes. It's 2,000 years quick. We don't know. What we do know is it's 2,000 years closer to when he's coming back. The only thing I know is I know we're, we're seven years away. And the way I know we're seven years away is we're still here. And I promise you when the Lord comes back, I'm going home and I hope that all of you are too. Can you imagine waking up and, and finding that you were the one left behind? That would be a horrible, horrible thing. But here it's, it's put together in a way, it's, it's actually called a futuristic present. It means something that's beginning to take place now that will become to completion in the future. Jesus is preparing already for his return, but, and that assures the fact that one day he will come back. So when we see this, we realize there's a lot of power in this. Because a lot of people today are questioning, well, where's, I mean, Jesus, for 2,000 years, preachers have been saying he's coming back, he's coming back, he's coming back. And we don't think anything's really changed. It shouldn't startle us, though, because what we realize is he's promised that he's going to return. And I love this. There are 500 verses throughout Scripture that talks about the Lord's second return. When he, he's already come the first time as a baby in the manger, but he's coming back again, the second return. And there's over 500 verses. Let me just give you just a few. Uh, beginning in Genesis 49.10, this will bless Dale. When, when Jacob is on, on his deathbed and he's giving the promises, he's giving the blessings out to his son, and he gets to, to Judah, and this is what he says. He said, the sepulcher will not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh comes. Well, why is that important? Because it says Shiloh will gather his people together. Who is Shiloh? What is Shiloh? The word Shiloh literally means peace. It is an attitude. It is a philosophy, but it is also a person. Shiloh is who we call the second person of the Trinity. It's all going to be given to him. And so, so the promise to Judah was that all through history that Judah would hold that scepter, which, which means that the king, he reigns in power and in promise. He reigns in glory. And that, that will not pass from them until the Lord himself comes back. When Shiloh, peace himself, comes back, he will take that and he will gather his people together. And of course, you know what a scepter is. It's something that royalty holds in their hand. It gives them authority. But make no mistake, Shiloh, the prince of peace, is coming. Another scripture I love is Matthew 16, 27. It says, For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with all the angels, and then shall his reward each to person according to his works. Acts 1, verses 10 and 11. And while they looked up steadfastly, into heaven they saw Jesus go up, and two men stood beside them in white apparel, <clears throat> which also said to him, Ye men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing here in heaven? This same Jesus that was taken up from you shall in exact like manner come back from heaven. So we see that all these different promises, there are skeptics out there. There are mockers out there. They are mocking Jesus today. They will mock you today. If you say, well, I'm just waiting for the Lord to return, they will mock you. Because they don't believe he's coming back. But the, the evidence is overwhelming that he is coming back. In 2 Peter uh, 3, 1 through 15, let me just quickly read these to you because I think there's a lot Peter has to say here. The second epistle, he says, Beloved, I write to you now. 
that both in which to stir your minds by the way of remembrance, that you may also be mindful of the words which were spoken by the holy prophets and the commandments of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, things continue as they were from the very beginning of creation. For these are willingly ignorant of that the word of God of the heavens of old and the earth standing out of the water and the earth in the water, whereby the world as it was in has been overflowed and the world perished. But the heavens and the earth which are now by the same word are kept in store reserved until the fire against the day of judgment and the perdition against ungodly men. Listen to this. But beloved, be not ignorant for this one thing, as a day is with the Lord, a thousand years, a thousand years is as one day with the Lord. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's why he said he hasn't come back yet. He hasn't come back because he is wanting people to repent of their sins, that they'll be in heaven with him. The Bible makes it clear that God loves everyone and desires no one to perish. So it's not that God's like, well, you know, maybe I'll wait a little. He's waiting for everyone to have the opportunity to repent. Verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. In other words, you're not going to know when it happens. In which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat, and the earth also, and the works whereof shall be burned up. Seeing then, this and all these things shall be dissolved. What manner of persons ought we to be in all of our conversation and all of our godliness? Looking for and hastening to. Now listen to this. Looking for looking for and hastening to the coming of the day of the Lord, wherein the heavens will be on fire, they shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for the new heavens and the new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you see such things, be diligent that you may be found in him peace without spot and blameless. Now let me just ask you, are you at a place today where if he were to come back, he would find you in peace? He would find you blameless? that he would find you without spot. And of course we know uh, concerning whether these prophecies are going to come true or not, we know that they will, but we also have the old prophecies, the prophecy of his first coming. And by the way, every single promise that God made about the, the first coming of the Lord has been fulfilled. Let me just give you one. I love this one. One of my favorite passages is Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. For a child will be born unto us, a son will be given unto us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor and Mighty God, Eternal Father and Prince of Peace. And there will be no end of the increase of his government or of peace. And on the throne of David and over the, his kingdom to establish and uphold with righteousness and justice from then on and forevermore. And the seal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. I love the fact, the seal of the Lord of hosts. In other words, not only is Jesus himself promising these things, the prophets were promising, but God himself testifies these things will come to pass. And we know concerning the first coming, they did come to pass. He was here. And so the, 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 they testify to the fact that he is coming back again. And of course, Psalm 2, 6 through 9 says, But as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. As he said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will surely give you the nations as your inheritance and the very sands of the sea as your possession. Also, Jesus himself promised in John 14, 1 through 6, he says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. For in my house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and I'm coming again to receive you unto myself. And then Thomas, bless his heart, has to doubt. The Lord's already told him, you know the way. And Thomas says, how can we know the way? He says, you know the way. I am the way. I am the way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. There is no other way apart from me. You and I have that same promise. We may be like Thomas at times. We may doubt. We may get down and out and get frustrated and wonder, Lord, when are you coming back? He says, I'm the way, I'm the truth. You put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. You know the way. You have the way. Not only is it behold his coming, but notice what it says, behold his coming with the clouds. I love that because in Scripture, clouds always represents the presence of God amongst his people. Now, this cloud is not to be interpreted as a vapor or some kind of a storm cloud. 
What I think is this, I think it's just a Shekinah cloud. This is a cloud that followed Israel by day as a pillar of fire, and, and it, 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 was, it hovered over the tabernacle and the temple. This is the Shekinah glory of God that he's talking about here. This is the cloud that Jesus will step out, and he will ride the cloud down to us. It shows his, his, his um, uh, uh, presence with us. When Jesus revealed his glory to Peter, James, and John on Mount Transfiguration, God the Father came in a bright cloud, it says, it's two pages. I don't want to skip two. Uh, saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Notice what it says. Listen to him. Hear him. That's in Matthew 17, 5. Jesus also claims that in his second coming, he says, I'm coming on the clouds of heaven. And that's in Matthew 24, 30. But this is what I find interesting here. Remember, we just got through studying uh, Daniel. And directly, John mentions here, the coming in the clouds is an allusion to Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. When Daniel says, that I was watching in the night watch. I was watching in those visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven. He is coming back, and He's coming back in His glory. It's coming with Him in the clouds. He's coming to be present amongst His people. And so, so you and I will be with Him because we will be there after the rapture, after the seven years of tribulation have taken place here, and after we've had our marriage supper land, we will come back with Him. We will see Him in all of His majesty. We'll see Him in all His glory, and so will the whole world. And for those who have, have pierced him, those who have, have rejected him, that's what pierced means. It's not talking about those who actually stuck the spear in his side or nailed him to the cross. He says, they're going to fear me. They're going to mourn. Why, is, why are they going to mourn? They're going to mourn because of the fact they've rejected him. They've pierced him. The second thing I want us to look at is behold his sighting. In verse 7, every eye shall see him. They'll see him in all his glory. Notice it says, all the tribes of all the earth. Interesting thing about this word mourn, it literally means to wail. It means to strike oneself. It means to be so in anguish that you're beating your chest because you're so frustrated. It's as though you've lost your firstborn child and you just don't know how to deal with it. And the, the, the anger and the, 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 the mourning is so strong. The, the pain is so intense. You're just beating yourself. And that's literally the word that's used here. And it says that they, every tribe will be doing that. Why? Because they rejected him, because they pierced him. And again, you don't have to be there with a spear to pierce him. When people reject Jesus Christ, what they're doing, they're saying your, your sacrifice is of no value whatsoever. They are scoffing at him, and they're piercing him every time they reject him, and they will be fearful over him. Why? Because while those who become believers during that time, they'll be rejoicing because for them it's the beginning. They've lived through the seven years of tribulation. They put their faith and trust in Christ. And so they're going to they're be at the beam of seat of Christ. And they're, they're, it's going to be a glorious day for them. But for everybody else, for all the world that have rejected him over and over and over and made fun of his sacrifice that he gives, they'll be mourning. This is the same concept that we see in 1 Kings 18, 27, and 28 when Elijah's on Mount Carmel with the prophets of Baal. Noon has passed, and they've been praying that, that their God would, would, would uh, send down fire to, to suck up the sacrifice, and it never happened. And, and Elijah comes to him and says, why don't you cry aloud? After all, he's your God. Maybe he's talking, or maybe he's pursuing some other endeavor. Maybe he's on a journey, or maybe he's asleep, just needs to be awakened. And the Bible says that they, they gnashed their teeth, and they cut themselves with stone lances until the Bible says the blood gushed out of them. It's the same idea. When, when Jesus comes back, and I want to remind you, the first time he came, he came as a lamb in humility. But when he comes back, the Bible says he's the lion of the tribe of Judah, and he's coming back in glory and in honor. And for those who put their faith and trust, they'll be so glad to see him. Lord, you're finally here. I've been waiting for you. These seven years have been horrible. But God, you're finally here. But all the rest of the world, they'll look and say, oh, no, you're here. And they'll be fear because they'll know he's coming in judgment. And for them, they'll be judged. And it won't be a good judgment. For those who put their faith and trust in Christ, it'll be a glorious day. And for the rest of them, well, let's just say it's not a good day for them. By the way, look what John says at the end of verse 7. So it is to be. Amen. There is no way this can be changed. This is the very strongest words of affirmation in the Greek language. And it means it will happen as stated. God has already determined it. And remember, God knows everything. He knows every variable of every situation in, that could ever happen. And here's what God is saying. God is telling John, and John is telling us, this is the way it's going to unfold. There's no, there's no other option. There's no second. Well, is there a plan B or a plan C? No. This is plan A. There is no other plan. God has already foreseen the fact that this is the way it's going to work out. And there will be those who will stand before God, and he'll say, I'm sorry, I never knew you. And they'll, be, they'll spend eternity separated from him. 
But then the third thing I want us to look at is behold his certainty. This thing will happen. Notice what he says here. He says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who was, who is, and is to come, the Lord God Almighty. Here he is putting his official stamp on the fact that the second coming will take place as described. Now, we think of past, present, and future. So for that, let's just think of he was, he is, and he will be, because that's past, present, future for us. What does he mean when he says he was? Well, when God the Father created the heavens and the earth and the universe, he was there. When Abraham took Isaac up to offer him as a sacrifice, he was there. When Moses parted the Red Sea, he was there. When the psalmist wrote Psalm 22, and so many people think that that's the psalm when he cries out, Oh my God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? They think it's, it, it, he, it's a psalm where he's, he's begging God not to let it happen, or God, why have you forsaken me? It's not. It's a psalm of victory, and he was there when it was being written. He knew why it was being written. When Jacob was wrestling, trying to find purpose, he was there. When Stephen was stoned, they're standing for God. He was there. All throughout the Old Testament, all throughout the New Testament, he has always been there. But not only was he there, but he is. So what does that mean? It means today, when you find yourself at a, and you have to offer a great sacrifice, and sometimes sacrifices come. And we have, to, we have to make sacrifices for the Lord Jesus Christ. He is here. He is with you during that sacrifice. But there's a sea ahead of you and the armies of Pharaoh are behind you and you feel like the devil's just closing in and you need a way of escape. He is with you. He is there. And when you feel forsaken, you may be forsaken by your husband, by your wife, by your family, by your friends. The whole world may forsake you, but there's one who will never leave you or forsake you. He is here with you. He was and he is. When you're searching for purpose and you're trying to find purpose in life, and I know what that's like. I can remember when those days at first Woodstock when I was a contractor and I'd go to work and I'm trying to, God, is this what you created me for? I mean, is it just to make money and be successful in the world's eyes? God, is, I mean, is that why I'm here? Seriously? Is it, I mean, and you're searching. I remember those days. The days that you're searching for purpose, he's here. He is with you to help you find purpose. And by the way, it's something we none of us want to talk about, but there's coming a day that for most of us, we're going to die. There may be some here that you're young enough, and the Lord, when the, when the rapture comes, you're going to be changed in a moment, twinkling an eye. I've always kind of had the feeling that I might actually be alive. I don't know. But I'm getting older now, and he hasn't come back yet, but he will. When the rapture takes place, there's coming a day when we're going to die, and they're going to roll us right here. And there'll be somebody say a few kind words over us, but I want you to know you're not alone. He's with you. Every single step of the way. He has been, he is, but not only he has been, he is, but he will. If you live to be 100, I want you to know he'll be with you all the way. He is to come. What does that mean? It means all the way through from the moment we are where we are at this moment right now until the Lord's return, he will be. He's not going to change. I love the fact that the devil thinks at the end of time, I mean, if you, if you want to look at how foolish the devil is, the devil honestly believes that if he can muster all the evil in the world, that at the, that the Battle of Armageddon, that last, I can beat Jesus. I, I, I mean, I've got so much power. Like Dale was talking about this morning, he said, actually, when he talks about, about God coming back, it says, though, he's just going, with one breath, he'll wipe it out. There is no match for the power of God. He says, I was, I am, and I forever, ever, ever, ever will be. A hundred billion years in the future, he will be. And that's his promise. And by the way, he's the one backing this up. He says, I am the Lord God who was, who is, and who will forever be. And he is coming back for his bride. So God affirms us. With this Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, I have all knowledge. I have all power. I have all might. I love the fact when he says, I am God Almighty. There's all power. There, he created Lucifer. Lucifer has no chance against him. We need to remember, like I said before, the first time Jesus came, he came as a lamb in humility. But when he returns, it will be an exaltation. 2 Timothy 4.8 testifies the fact that only those who love his appearing who love him and acknowledge him as the only rightful king will have the blessings of the kingdom. So my question is this, are we looking for his coming? King Richard the Lionhearted, king of England, one of the few kings that you recognize by the, his, his title instead of his number, Henry IV and all these different ones to try to figure out who they are, Elizabeth II and the third. And 
You say, Richard the Lionheart, do people know who you're talking about? Oh, uh, that king of England. Oh, he was the first king, Richard. I, I know who he was. Now, the sad thing is there's so many stories about, about King Richard. And so there's been a lot of movies made. In fact, the most popular movies made about his time is Robin Hood. And, of course, by the way, it wasn't the, the sheriff of Nottingham that took over. But actually, it was King Richard's brother, John who took over. He was in France trying to take care. He took his military to France trying to, to save some. He had a lot of, of land in France, had a lot of uh, property in France, and he's there protecting his property from the French. And uh, his, his brother John takes the throne, and his brother John was a horrible, horrible person. He persecuted the people. He made them where they were, where they were destitute. They were poor. They, hey, they were praying, God, send us back King Richard. God, send us back King Richard. And they kept praying and praying, God, send us back King Richard. And finally one day, King Richard came back. And when he came back, it didn't take him no time at all. He, he threw John out. He destroyed the kingdom John had created. And he raised his people back up. And everybody was rejoicing over the fact that the king had come home. Well, I have a, one of the favorite, one of my favorite movies is one of those Robin Hood movies. It just happens to be the one with Kevin Costner from years ago. And you remember at the end, when there he's standing in, in front of Friar Tuck and he's getting ready to get married to, uh, to, to Marion? And Friar Tuck says, is there any reason that I should not marry these? And all of a sudden the camera pans back and there's that gorgeous white horse. And someone's stepping down and you see that red lion on his chest and you know this is, this is King Richard. And then that voice of Sir Sean Connery. Wow. Hey, I'll go home and watch it today for that one scene. But I'm a Sean Connery fan, obviously. But I, and I didn't know he was going to be in a movie. That cameo appears to me. I mean, he's back. Well, there's the day coming when the King of Kings is coming back. It's going to be more glorious than anything that Hollywood could ever, ever produce. And those who mourn because they opposed him, they pierced him. Remember that behold means to call to attention. Put your mind in order. Carefully consider what's being said. What is God saying to you today? I don't think it was by happenstance that God led us to go through Daniel and now to go into Revelation. There is a reason that God orchestrated this. It's not just, oh, well, you got to have something to share. So Revelation is as good as anybody else. Any other scripture, I'm just as good. I believe God has a purpose. God has something he wants to say to you, and God has something he wants to say to me. And he says, behold, pay attention. What is it that God is saying to you? Maybe you're looking, maybe you don't have salvation. Maybe you really have never repented of your sin, put your faith and trust in Christ. And, and he said, be saved. Because otherwise, the other option is you go through the seven years of tribulation. Even if you get saved on the other side of the seven years, you got to go through seven years of tribulation. And there's no guarantee that you would believe. I mean, after all, once the power of the Holy Spirit has gone with us, it's not the only power of the Holy Spirit will be with 144,000. Who knows what kind of contact you'll have with them. So you have seven years of tribulation to, to work through. Maybe you are saved, but you're looking for purpose. You're wondering, God, there's got to be more to life than this. And he's right here with you. He's wanting to give you purpose. What is God saying to you today? Maybe he's telling you you need to, to unite with this church and, and, and join hands with us as we do our very best to really make a difference here in this community and reach this world for Christ. The question is this, in light of what this message is saying, how will my life be different? Am I anticipating? Am I looking for? Notice what he says in Peter. Seeing then that these things are going to come to pass, what manner of person should we be? Am I being the person that God wants me to be? Am I living my life doing what God wants me to do? Or am I living my life for me? The prophecies, he says, I am the Alpha, the Omega, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come. And the Bible says that we are to look for his return. We are to anxiously look. We are to work for his return. He's coming again. Before we moved up here, Debbie and I lived up on Mount Yona in Cleveland, Georgia, and looked over Bigger's Bottoms, the valley down below. We lived a mile up a dirt road, and uh, it was interesting because you could hear the cars below. Now, the one thing we didn't like, we didn't, you know, those little big cars, they have the big muffler, and that's all the hours of a tailpipe. They go, Ring. 
Well, they would come to Cleveland once a year, and we hated that. That weekend was a horrible weekend because we could hear them all weekend long, just up one side and down the other. Didn't like those little cars. Finally, they, they caused so much damage that, that, that Helen, Georgia, actually outlawed them from coming through there, so it stopped. But, but any time a car was coming up the road, dirt road, we could hear it. I had a 64 and a half uh, white Ford pickup with a 289, and when I hit the bottom of the hill, Debbie could hear me coming. She knew, oh, it's coming home. Our son, Byron, who still lived in North Carolina at the time, he would come down to visit us occasionally. And he had that big old Dodge with a 383 Magnum. You know the sound it makes? We, we could hear him coming up the road before he ever got to the dirt road. We'd hear him coming and say, there's Byron. And me and Debbie would be on the front porch. She'd be in a swing. I'd be in a rocking chair just waiting. And sure enough, you'd hear it coming up that dirt road. <laughs> and all of a sudden, he'd turn his driveway, and our son was home. And we have a great time of fellowship with him. I was glad to see him. Well, there's a day coming when the King of Kings coming, and we ought to be looking for him more than we're looking for my son. We ought to be looking for him more than anybody's looking for me or for you. Are you anticipating? We ought to be at the window. I mean, just, Lord, is it today? He says that's what our heart and our attitude ought to be. There's a beautiful, glorious day coming for those of us who are believers because the rapture will take place, the seven years of tribulation will be gone by, and we will come back with him. But for those who don't know, it's going to be a horrible, horrible time. And I would rather that number decrease that don't know him than increase. And the way it can decrease is by us living out day by day, by telling people on this street and this street and this next neighborhood, all the way to Thailand, India, wherever God sends us, by telling them, about Jesus because there is a day he's coming back and they need to repent of their sin and put their faith and trust in Jesus this side of eternity because they won't have the opportunity that side of eternity.